very first thing I want to say is thank you to Ron and to the Young Investigators group for inviting me. I just had a great time. I've never been to a meeting like this before, and I wish we had something like this in the U.S. It's been wonderful. It's been delightful to meet you guys, and I've just had a great time. I also want to comment that I've, when Ron asked me to do this, I, I was late turning it in because I just thought, wow, somebody really wants to know about my career? It seems like an odd thing to talk about. So I've never done this before, and it's really, it, it turned out to be an actually a very um, a reflective thing for me, and it's, it's come at a great time in my career, and I will use the reflection I got in creating this talk uh, to make some decisions about the near future. So I call this talk accidentally a professor because, to be absolutely truthful, I have I never in my life had any goal to ever work at a university or uh, be a professor. And so I'll tell you the story of how I ended up at, at Stanford. This is me as a kid in the back, I'm the oldest of six children. And the reason I show this to you is because we're a very close family, but we're very different. And I venture to say that I'm probably closer in temperament and in my interests to you than I am to my own family members. And I ask you to remember that because in my experience through my career, no matter if I'm in Finland or if I'm in South Africa or if I'm in the Arctic or if I'm in North Carolina, anywhere in Europe, I have encountered academics who I instantly befriend. And I'll tell you that we have more in common in the way we go through our lives than I do with my parents and my siblings. So when I started, um, I, I've lived all over the world. My parents moved a lot. I lived every year or two years in different places. What that meant is I didn't have a really tight friend network. I didn't have a home except for with my family. And because I'm one of six, we were a team. So I'm the oldest and my youngest one, my sister Teresa down there in my mom's lap, is just seven years younger than I am. So six children in seven years, we were a team, okay? So pretty amazing. And that's my mom, right, after six kids. Yeah, she still looks close to that now. She weighs about 95 pounds. Okay, so my early years, a lot of travel. So why, why was that? Why was what? Why did you travel so much? Because of my dad. My dad was in the army. Okay. And so we moved everywhere. I lived one year, two years. I went to, I was born in Germany. I went to high school in Italy, all over the place, all over the U.S., no home. So my, and, and by the way, for that entire time, I never was on a college campus, okay? So never was on a college campus. I lived in Italy in high school, and so then I was applying to schools in the U.S. never having been on a college campus. Had no idea what I was doing. In my, I was a, you know, a nerdy kid. I was, um, you know, I, Ubi showed us his books. I was Time Life books. I would sit and pour over them, Encyclopedia Britannica. I would read them page after page, just learning new things. I was content with books, with you know, playing with my hands, with being outside. And what my mom used to do when we lived around Washington, D.C., is she would just drop me off at the Smithsonian. It's free, and I would roam those halls all day long while she was out shopping and doing other things in D.C. with the rest of my family. I saw a lot of people give talks there. She would take me to National Geographic talks. And I learned about science in this, I just was, I just absorbed it. I, I, I loved it. I was good at math as well and science. I'll tell you, I never in my entire life, even to now, have had a woman science or math teacher, not one. And so it was difficult for me in some ways to think about what a girl would do with my interests. In the end, I just thought, I'll be a doctor. Okay, but that took a while. So my early years were full of solitude. And I show this tree because that's where I spent a lot of my time. I'd go outside and I'd climb trees. I'd go outside and I'd dig holes in the ground. I created forts. I built rafts to go on the Occoquan River. I was this, you know, my parents, I was my mom and dad would bring a cowbell for dinner. I was always late. I was always by myself, and I was always somewhere in the woods and in the dirt. 
So that's my childhood. And the reason this particular part, I, I was mentioning this to Uthi earlier today, this particular part of my life and this reflection has been so valuable here is because this is what I miss now. We are so busy. I don't have this kind of time to just explore, to dig up a plant, to look at the roots, to taste things, to look at a stream and turn rocks over and find the insects. I just don't have that kind of time anymore. So I had a somewhat of a non-traditional education. I have three degrees in completely different fields. I started off at the University of Colorado. You'll notice that there is, with the exception of Berkeley, I have mountains in, I just am drawn to mountains. Um, I, I, I love them. I love spending time. Peak. Sorry? Peak. Kind of, but it's not the same. <laughs> anyway, I, I, from Italy, I went to Colorado for the deep reason that they had red roofs, just like Florence and Assisi did. <laughs> Plus skiing was nearby. Um, I started there in pre-med, and I discovered physical anthropology and absolutely fell in love with human evolution. And so I majored in anthropology. Then I had a little uh, bit of a detour, which I'll tell you about in a second, and then eventually went and got my Master's of Science in Quaternary Studies. How many know what the Quaternary is? Nobody. The Quaternary is the last two million years of Earth history. So this is a degree about, it was geology, climatology, anthropology, and biology of the last two million years of the planet. So one of the themes in my, my curiosity about the world is how did the world come to be? So my interest at the Smithsonian, I was always in early American, I was in primates, I wanted to know how we became and how culture came and how ecosystems evolved. So I did my degree in Northern Arizona and then I went to Berkeley um, and graduated with a PhD in integrative biology. Before my master's degree, I ended up in Yellowstone National Park through quirk of circumstances I started there as a volunteer, and this place has become my religion. This is my, this is the place I go to in my mind. It's extraordinary. It's the first, it was created in 1872. It has a completely intact mammal fauna. And part of that is, is something that I helped, helped create, and that's the reintroduction of the wolf, and I'll tell you about that in a second. So I eventually worked um, from a volunteer to the first and probably only National Park Service paleoecologist. So my job there was to basically reconstruct the past. I created it because there were people studying modern ecology and asking questions about whether or not wolves were native or wolf uh, or elk were native. I thought, well, gosh, the easiest way to answer that question isn't to do some study on grass, but to go back in time and see if they were here several thousand years ago. And it hadn't occurred to anyone to do that. So I became the only paleontologist in Yellowstone and, and absolutely loved that job. I've worked with grizzly bears, with bighorn sheep, I've worked with small mammals. Um, this, I know their geology here, I know, you know, you could put me anywhere in here blindfolded and I know would know how to get out. It's about two and a half million acres and it's an extraordinary gem in the U.S. So the story of elk was that politically elk were in enormous populations. And they're, they're eating a lot of what you see in the foreground here, these, these bunch grasses. And so, and this is on what is essentially in this part of the park, which is the northern part of the park. You can see that there's not a lot of dense grass here. These are uh, landslide deposits. They're, it's a very dry. This particular part of the park has actually got about the same amount of moisture as Tucson. Only it's a much higher latitude. It's 45 degrees north. And so the, the latitude means it's a slightly more wet, uh, slightly wetter, but grasses take a tough time, uh, take a long time to grow. They're bunch grasses, they don't form carpets of grass, and the elk are enormous numbers, thousands of individuals, and they ate them. So the controversy was whether or not elk were native. And the only reason that, the only, during, you know, about 20,000 years ago, uh, the terrain, you see this is all under ice. This is a giant, um, uh, these are, uh, Spring flow deposits, this is a giant lake. Uh, there was a dam here, and this is a, a paleo lake from the Pleistocene. 
bison are native here. So what I did is I set about trying to understand what is the prehistory of this place. There are very few paleontologists in the world, and in fact, when I did this, I would venture to say I was the only one interested in the last 10,000 years of history. And why? Because most paleo people go back to extinct animals. I wanted to know how the extant animals we have on the planet came to be. What did they do after we lost during, you know, about 20,000 years ago? Uh, the terrain, you see this is all under ice. This is a giant, um, uh, these are uh, spring flow deposits. This is a giant lake. Uh, there was a dam here. And this is a, a paleo lake from the Pleistocene. Bison are native here. So what I did is I set about trying to understand what is the prehistory of this place? There are very few paleontologists in the world, and in fact, when I did this, I would venture to say I was the only one interested in the last 10,000 years of history. And why? Because most paleo people go back to extinct animals. I wanted to know how the extant animals we have on the planet came to be. What did they do after we lost the megafauna? How were they handling environmental change? And so I set about uh, asking this question, and that is still kind of the hallmark of my lab. So the way I did it is I excavated caves. And I'm pretty happy in caves. Um, they can get very uncomfortable and a little bit claustrophobic. But it's like the ultimate puzzle. Puzzles to me are the most wonderful thing on the planet. I like looking at tiny things, at, at how they fit together. I like the shapes. I like the patterns. I like the, the, the ultimate goal. I love the changing scales of that. And when you excavate, it's like every single trowel fold is a mystery. It's a just an, it's like what some people feel like in, in, on, in their bench. This is how I feel in a cave. So I reconstructed the fossil history of Yellowstone from these two caves. There are uh, literally hundreds of thousands of specimens that I've identified, and I've taken back um, the, the modern ecosystem, and so we, I have identified about 95% of the extant mammals in Yellowstone in these two caves from northern Yellowstone. This is, uh, these are some of the bones from the deposit, and I'll show you this bone right here. Turns out to be, it's a metacarpal of a wolf. And at the time I was doing my work, there were no wolves in Yellowstone, because we had eradicated them. We had hunted them down, we had hunted all of them. They were, had been extinct in the 20s and 30s. And so this was a foundation for restoring this ecosystem, for reintroduction of the Yellowstone wolf, which happened in 1995. So this paleo work allowed us to very confidently say, wolves are in fact native, here's their evidence, and it allowed the reintroduction of the wolf to take place. And so now, all of the mammals that were present 2,000 years ago in Yellowstone are present there today. And, and I know that because I've trapped these animals, I've seen them, I've documented them, plus I have their fossil record. So after I graduated from, this took many, many years to, this was my master's and my PhD to pull all this together. And after that, I ended up getting a job at Montana State University, another place with mountains and skiing. Uh, the roofs were kind of terrible, but anyway. <laughs> Um, and I, I was hired right out of my PhD as a research assistant professor. I had no postdoc. They gave me a lab and they gave me startup. And I started immediately working on ancient DNA because I wanted to know, wanted to study these same specimens, but I wanted to know how are they responding in terms of their uh, genotype? How, what's their population doing? I'd studied their morphology, I'd studied their population size, I'd studied community assembly, and I wanted to know a little bit more about how their populations responded. And since this job in Montana, I've continued to take that through, and now we're working on population genomics in my lab. However, well, also at this at Montana State, my research then went, it expanded from Yellowstone. Montana is really, Montana State is in Bozeman, right next to Yellowstone. I thought, this is a match made in heaven. You know, here I am, right near my field site. It turned out one of the first things I did when I went to Montana State is I, I started doing the same research in another ecosystem to test my hypotheses, to test how these animals responded to climate change in Yellowstone. I wanted to go to another national park in another place with a completely different fauna to ask if the same thing happened. Did climate affect these animals in the same way? And so I ended up in Patagonia working on a completely different system but excavating a couple of caves there um, as well. 
However, I loved this, I loved my position, I loved my place, I liked my work. I wasn't teaching there, but it was a temporary research professor job. So when it came time, about three years in, to have you know, my job become permanent, they just didn't think that they wanted me to be a faculty member to teach. I had no teaching experience except for lab courses at Berkeley. And I just thought, well, the only way to do this is to I'll start applying for jobs. Okay, so I have to apply for jobs and then use that as some sort of negotiation tool. I applied for jobs. I went and interviewed at Stanford. And two days later, they offered me the job. I mean, where did this come from? So I had, I had no idea and no concept about what this place would mean to me. It has been a match made in heaven, really. I mean, it's a place where in the boundaries between departments, I mean, you already know I have these three different degrees. I do geology, I do climate, I do small mammals, I do genetics. I, I, you'll see I do some humanities kinds of work as well. This is a place where boundaries between departments are almost non-existent, and I could do anything I wanted here, and I have loved my job. I also came to love, love my students. I came to, I was terrified. I spent months working on my first lecture, and now I absolutely adore teaching. So I, I use that as something to say, be bold, try new things, all of you. If you think you know who you are. I mean, part of the way to really know what you're made of is to try something completely new. So I like teaching students in the lab, I like teaching them in the classroom, and I like taking them into the field. Along the way, and this actually started when I was a PhD student at Berkeley, I had my first daughter, Emma, and now my daughters are 22 and 18, and they have come with me everywhere. This is something that may come up in the women in science, um, discussion later, but you know the only reason I could do the work that I do is because I took them with me. I, got, I went so far as to take, I, when I worked in Patagonia, I took a nanny with me down there to watch my daughters, because my youngest was nine months old, to watch my daughters while I was working. So the only way, so these guys are incredible in the field. They teach my graduate students um, things in the field, and, and uh, they're just, they're great. Neither of them, however, want to be scientists, so they already are, but they don't want to go into that as a field. So that's, a, that's kind of an interesting uh, thing, but they love, uh, they love field work. So my research in general is how do animals respond to environmental perturbation? And I've left, you know, I'm not working just in the fossil record anymore. I work, this is a snapshot from my website just a few days ago. I mean, these are the kinds of projects I'm working on. And you can see I'm working in Costa Rica and Central America. I'm looking, at, as I said, at Patagonia. I'm working here in the Himalayas looking at pikas and their adaptations to hypoxia. So uh, I'm working on, I'm working with Uma Ramakrishnan on the genetics um, and our projections for the future genetic diversity of tigers in, in Asia. Um, we're going to be working on a larger project in that over the next year. I still work in North America. And basically, I, my research has become global. I work on the past, I work in the present, and the goal of both of those sets of research is to understand human domination of the landscape and how biodiversity will respond in the future. So my research has changed a lot. I put these two slides in at the, at, at just, just this morning because I wanted to kind of underscore what Vijay said on the first day about human biomass. And this is the kind of way that the past has informed me about our future. So we're projected to have temper global temperature warming in, you know, by the year 2050, warmer than humans have experienced as a species. And by the year 2100, we'll hit temperatures warmer than most of the mammals that exist on the planet have ever, ever experienced in their lifetimes, the species lifetimes, warmer than the planet has experienced in 14 million years. So that history has given me a perspective about where we're headed in the future that is profound and unique. It's something that many people don't have. One of the things about biomass and biodiversity is that for, for you know, since humans evolved, really, um, we evolved at pretty low effective biomass um, on the planet. We caused the extinction, here's the last global warming, and this probably relates to um, human uh, overhunting throughout much of the world. We caused the extinction of a lot of the megafauna, and so there was a dip in global biomass, mammalian biomass. These are large mammals. 
And then in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the reason why part of, you know, this is humans by, its, by its ourselves, but this is with humans and our livestock. So we, the reasons why we have increased biomass with humans and our commensal animals is because we're mining the lives of past diversity that lived on the planet. I mean, we say fossil fuels and don't think about it, but what this means is previous, bi previous biomes, previous planetary diversity is now serving us um, uh, and, and we're way past the supporting system of the planet. We're over, uh, there's probably one and a half times to, to three times of the planetary um, biomass support system because we're mining uh, past diversity. This is another, um, this is what I've become as a glo global change scientist. I take to heart what Mike said. You know, I'm no longer, I mean, I struggle. I'm not a paleobiologist, evolutionary biologist, ecologist. Now I am a global change scientist. Virtually all the work I've done since I was a master's student always has a point of what does this mean for our future? What does this mean for the present and the future? I am a global change scientist. This is a schematic that's done to, to exact scale of the biomass of wild animals right now on the planet, the biomass of humans on the planet, and our commensal animals. So to give you a sense of just how much we've dominated ecosystem services on the planet, uh, this is a, a little bit of a glimpse of that. Over 50% of the actual numbers of individuals of species on the planet um, are gone in just the last few decades. So I've been writing more and more about these global emergencies, population size uh, on the planet. India's scheduled to be number one population size in the near future, right, over chi surpassing China. Africa is still increasing at a tremendous rate, population growth rate. So we have population growth, we have climate change, we have pollution, there's uh, invasive species, there's extinction, there's ecosystem services, and ecosystems are, are being lost. So we wrote a paper, this is a story about this new kind of uh, direction in, that I'm taking really personally. This paper, Approaching State Shift in Earth's Biosphere, with a number of authors, I think there's 16 of us, um, from all around the world, got a lot of press. And that press resulted in an article above the fold of the San Francisco Chronicle that Governor Jerry Brown of the state of California read. And he called Anthony Barnosky, who happens to be my husband and the lead author on this paper, while Tony was out running and said, so why is this paper so important? If it's so important, why aren't you scientists shouting it from the rooftops? And the thing is, is we thought we were, right? I mean, we thought we were shouting it from the rooftops. And here's the governor. This guy is smart. I think he has a photographic memory. He's a really smart guy. He said, what is the big deal about this? Why can't you write a paper I understand? And so with his suggestion, what we did is we wrote what's called a scientific consensus. And, and so this particular consensus is basically a result of this paper, but it's written for policymakers. So we went back and forth. This took about six months. We went back and forth with the governor's office, and he didn't have anything to do with the content, nor did any of his staff. However, they had a lot of feedback about the font, the color, where we, we what they wanted an executive summary, because the governor had plans for this document. So he said, okay, now you've done this, I want it endorsed by scientists. And we immediately used our network, the 16 of us that, that pulled this together. Within three weeks, we had about 3,000 scientists from 40 countries sign this document. All it is is saying, you guys need to wake up and think about all of these issues together. You can't deal with climate change if you don't confront population. Climate change is essentially the result of pollution. So we basically put all these things together. There's nothing new in this paper except the synergy of these forces. And this document has been used by Jerry Brown in remarkable ways. It's been translated into Portuguese, into Spanish, into French, into Nepali. It's been used as for an agreement with the uh, 
the um, premier of China. This is not the premier, pre uh, President Xi. This is premier of the environment. They've ended up with a, uh, there's, Jerry Brown has used this to sign agreements, memorandums of understanding with subnationals. So we're working right now with uh, Kathmandu. It's, they've used it for uh, signatures from Mexico, with um, British Columbia, with Oregon, with um, uh, Washington State, with France, with I think Prince Charles is interested in this. We have a website. So Jerry Brown takes boxes of these documents wherever he goes. What he does, he's used it also for the head of Chevron, for the head of Shell. He throws it down on there. Uh, this is what his staff tells us. He takes this document and he throws it down on the table when he's in a meeting and says, do you know about these issues covered in this document? If you do, what are you doing about it? If you don't, read this and talk to me again. So he has used this at, to great, you know, there's nothing special about this except we took science and boiled it down into uh, a dis discussion of that the policymakers and business leaders and the public can understand. So science communication is something that I'm, I'm very much interested in now because I think that we, we're in this ivory tower and we talk to each other, but we don't do a good job of talking to the public. And I can tell you my entire career is something that's been publicly funded, whether it was with the National Park Service, all of my National Science Foundation funding. It's an extraordinary gift, and I want to be able to tell people what I'm doing and why it's important. This is something we're increasingly being called on in the U.S. to do, and I encourage you guys to be able to boil it down. People always say the elevator speech, but tell people in plain language why what you're doing is important. So this is a course that I took, the Fusion of Art and Science. It was extraordinary. We took six scientists, six artists, and we took them out in the field for three weeks. We immersed them in this. We had a big uh, art show. It stayed in the Cantor Arts Museum on campus for a year and a half, and it was, was life-changing for the students we took. Again, the ability to communicate even visually about the message that we put in that paper. This is now, we handed this to Governor Brown. This is the result of that nature paper. This is earth, clean water, clean air, biodiversity. There should be stratigraphy here representing the past. Here's the planet. Here's a person. This is the future. Agriculture to feed all of our, our nearing you know, 9 billion people on the planet. Housing for all of them. And you know, clearly energy for all of them. But in the background is some hope, some greenery, some green space, and some technology. We gave this to Governor Brown, and he said, who's that little guy? And we said, it's you. And this is hanging behind his office desk. So one, this is, I asked a technician who's also an artist in my lab to do this. And this is an example of just an illustration that conveys what we said in all of those scientific words in our nature paper. And in many ways, I think this is seen by many more people than that nature paper ever will be. So not only outside the ivory tower, but inside the ivory tower. For the last two years, I've been the senior associate vice provost for undergraduate education at Stanford, and I'm working on STEM education. This is a big change for me. And like what Maria said yesterday, administration is not anything that I aspire to do, but I think it's critical to reinvigorate the science education in the US to basically make sure that our humanists are literate in science as well, to make sure they understand something about probability and risk, to make sure that our pre-med students who are just, they hit the ground running and all they want to do is memorize all those facts and pass their MCATs and get into a great med school, they also need to be able to sit down and speak to someone from another culture. They need to be able to talk to their uh, neighbors and I encourage them to read Shakespeare and take a class in art or sculpture and go abroad. So that's a story of where I am now and I'll, and I'll just end with a little bit of reflection for you. How, how will you succeed? And I encourage you to really be reflective about this because if you aren't now, it will happen to you in your career at some point. It happens to a lot of my graduate students while they're in grad school. And it happens when you're an assistant professor around tenure. There are times where you think, how the heck am I going to do it, and what do I want to do? I would say be opportunistic. We were talking about grants this morning. 
I put these fur seals up. These are northern fur seals. I knew nothing about northern fur seals. I had a postdoc in my lab who had done some isotopic work on northern fur seals. And I had five other grants pending at the time at the National Science Foundation. I submitted a grant to work on northern fur seals, ancient DNA, with this postdoc. I didn't get the five other grants that I knew all about. I, you know, those were the ones I really wanted to do. I got this grant about northern fur seals. And so I proceeded to work on northern fur seals for several years. So be opportunistic and be prepared to take the funds and the, you know, basically the chances that are given to you. I've diversified my research immensely. I started off just working with mammals. Now I have people in my lab, in fact, I'd say more people in my lab working on reptiles and amphibians than on mammals. It's been an amazing experience and, and really, really, really fun. Um, I've, I've delved into developmental biology of salamanders. I've enjoyed that immensely. And, and so I encourage you to be diverse because you, you don't always get the funds or the enthusiasm for a single project. And then be a beginner. Be willing to be a lifelong learner. This is my graduate student, Hannah Frank. She's right now in Costa Rica. I'm so jealous, although I, I'm glad I'm here. And, and this is a, an illustration of her taking um, a saliva swab from these bats. So we're sampling the bat diversity in this part of Costa Rica. There are about 101 species. And in the Americas, no one's ever studied anything about spillover and disease in bats. So there are less than a handful of those studies, and we're in the process of trying to understand what the pathways of spillover might be from uh, a landscape that's being severely degraded from intact forest all the way to um, very uh, monoculture pi uh, pineapple plantations. And so I don't know much about disease, but I'm learning a lot. And we now have funds because of a grant that I, I submitted about this, which is really exciting. And in the end, I'd say, this is something you've heard from everyone, right? All of us who've come up here is just to find your own path. I am definitely not um, from someone else's cookbook. I've made my own, and I don't expect any of the students in my lab to be like me. I hope they're not. This last slide is a slide my daughter gave me. I don't know if everyone can see it, but she just gave this to me um, a few weeks ago, and it's dead on right. So this is you know, a Venn diagram of you love it, you're great at it, the world needs it, and you're paid for it. Okay, so you're paid for it and you're great at it. That's your profession. The world needs it and you're paid, and you're paid for it. That's your vocation. You love it, passion and mission. And in the end, the place that's the sweet spot, and this is what I'm trying to achieve right now, is my purpose. And that's where all of these things coalesce. I encourage you to try and find that as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening.